Bishop John, and thank you all for inviting me here. It's a great honor for me to be able to address you today on such a topic of importance. Uh, we see practically every day horrific new stories about the persecution of Christians in uh, the Middle East and elsewhere in the Islamic world. And I thought that today it would be useful in order to help you to understand why this is all happening to uh, take you through the Islamic view of Christians and Christianity as per the Islamic holy book, the Quran. I know that you had a Bible study earlier and so I thought it would be a good time to have a little Quran study. And so uh, I know you all have yours. If you'd open your Qurans to uh, <laughs> chapter five, verse 46, uh, you'll see that the Quran actually says something that is often cited by spokesmen who are hastening to tell us that there really isn't any problem and that ultimately there is a great welcoming spirit within Islam for Christians and Christianity. And uh, chapter 5, verse 46, it says, And we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, after those prophets, confirming the truth of whatever there still remained of the Torah, and we gave him the gospel, wherein is guidance and light. Wherein is guidance and light in the gospel? And so you would think this is a very generous ecumenical statement that the gospel contains guidance and light. And so a Christian can look at that and say, well, this is great. This is a, a, a holy book of another religion that in a rather unprecedented and unusual manner is recognizing the truth of the holy book of a different religion. But there's more. Very shortly after that passage, we can go to chapter 5, verse 65, and just in case you don't have your Quran, I'll read it for you. Uh, had the people of the book, that's the Quran's term primarily for Jews and Christians, had the people of the book only believed and been God-fearing, we surely, we being God, surely would have effaced from them their evil deeds and caused them to enter the gardens of bliss. Okay, so what, it is, what is it that the people of the book, that is the, the Jews and the Christians, had to do in order to enter the gardens of bliss? Had the people of the book, it goes on, observed the Torah and the gospel and all that had been revealed to them from their Lord, sustenance would have been showered over them from above and would have risen from beneath their feet. Some among them in certainly keep to the right path, but many of them do things that are evil. So now we have two groups of Christians, some that are on the right path and some that do evil. And if only they had kept to, if had the people of the book observed the Torah and the gospel, then everything would have been okay. So it seems as if there's some of these people of the book, some of the Christians, who don't observe what's in the gospel. And they are obviously the ones on the wrong path. But what, is it actually, what has actually gone wrong in their way of thinking? according to the Quran. In chapter 5, verse 17 and 72, it repeats it twice. The statement that unbelievers are those who say Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. That is, those who affirm the divinity of Christ, those who say that Allah, or God, is Christ, or that Christ is God, then they are unbelievers. And so, in one fell swoop, in those two passages, that passage that is actually affirmed twice, the Quran is actually saying that the faith of all, virtually all Christians throughout history, Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, is a manifestation of unbelief. And of course, there's more besides. In chapter 4, verse 171, it says, they did not kill or crucify him, but it appeared so unto them. In other words, they thought they were crucifying him, but they weren't really. Which, of course, takes away the cross, the resurrection, the salvation of Christ, the sacrificial death, the atonement. The whole heart of Christianity is gone. Many, many other passages in the Quran affirm very strongly that it is against the transcendent majesty of God to say that he would have a son that for him to have a son would be to imply some insufficiency on his part. 
That is the assumption. I don't think that that's really a true statement regarding fatherhood on a human level or when you were talking about the divinity, but nonetheless, this is what is affirmed. So you have, I think I said the wrong number, I'm sorry, 4157 is about the crucifixion, if you're taking notes. But what we have in all this, and in so many other passages, such as chapter five, verse 116, when Allah actually questions Jesus about what he taught, says, in the, in the hereafter, Allah will say, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to people, take me and my mother as gods besides Allah? This is the Quran's understanding of the Trinity, not the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but uh, God, Jesus, and Mary. And God asks him, Allah asks him, did you tell your followers to worship you and your mother as gods along with me? And Jesus answers, glory to you. It was not for me to say, but I had no right to say. If I had said so, you would have known it. You know all that is within my mind, whereas I do not know what is within yours. Obviously then, Jesus is not God and is not part of the Godhead. So, we have here, obviously, a, some very serious theological disagreements between Islam and all sects and schools of thought within Christianity that are mainstream and have been throughout history. However, all that amounts to so far is just essentially that, a theological disagreement, of which there are many, of course. And Christians, of course, have theological disagreements among themselves. And so this, in itself, would not account for the persecution by itself. The problem, of course, is that in the Islamic context, there is a great deal more to it besides. That when you have theological disagreements, then they take on a very different character when combined with the Islamic view that the Muslims are the executors of the will of Allah. And this is a very important point. In, in, in the scriptures we hear, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. And Christians are not to take revenge, not to avenge themselves in any way, according to the scriptures. In the Quran, you have exactly the opposite teaching. As a matter of fact, you have the explicit obligation given to Muslims to be the executors of God's wrath on earth. In chapter 9, verse 74, it says, speaking about unbelievers, they are spiteful against Muslims for no other reason than that Allah and his messengers have enriched them through his bounty. So if they repent, it will be for their own good. But if they turn away, Allah will sternly punish them in this world and in the hereafter. So in other words, the unbelievers will not only be going to hell, but will be punished in this world. And how will God punish the unbelievers in this world? By means of the Muslims. In chapter 9, verse 14, it says, Make war on them. Allah will chastise them through you. Allah will chastise them through you. That God, in other words, in the Islamic scheme of things, will use the believers, the Muslim believers, to punish those who deviate from creedal orthodoxy. He will chastise them through you. So this creates, you see, an obligation for a pious and knowledgeable Muslim and understands it to be the perfect word of God that existed forever with God in paradise and then was delivered in perfect form to Muhammad and has been preserved throughout the ages down to our present day. This creates in such a person a feeling that he has a responsibility before God to fight against those who have rejected the faith, who have, as the Christians have, deviated from the truth that the, of the gospel, they have to be punished in this world and in the next, and, done, and the Muslims have to do the punishing. You see, in the Islamic scheme of things, Jesus was a Muslim prophet who taught Islam. Then the gospel was guidance and light. But afterward, his followers came along and they twisted and hijacked the original 
perfect teachings of Jesus that corresponded exactly with the teachings of Muhammad who would come later. And they changed them into something in which Jesus dies on a cross and is the Son of God and part of the Trinity, thus outraging the truth of the message of Christ and placing them into the camp of the unbelievers who have to then be punished by the hand of God working through his true believers. So when we see this persecution in the Middle East, when we see the Islamic State, or ISIS as it's popularly known, waging war against the Christians, driving them out of lands that they have lived in for centuries, the people who are doing that believe that they are carrying out a divine responsibility, something that will bring them blessings from God. You may recall that Jesus himself said, in the Gospel of John, the time will come when men will kill you and think they're offering service to God. That time is upon us now. The time will come when men will kill you and think they're offering service to God. That is happening every day in Iraq, in Syria, and elsewhere. Now there's one obvious objection that may be in your minds at this point, and that is this, that the Christians who were, for example, driven out of Mosul, the Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Mosul, a very large and important city in Iraq, and a city that's had a Christian presence since the beginning of Christianity. The Chalde Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Mosul said a few months ago, he said, my entire diocese, my entire diocese has been lost to Islam. And the same thing will happen to the Christians in Europe and the United States if they don't wake up to what's happening. Now, the objection is this. The entire diocese of which the Archbishop of Mosul was speaking was under Islamic rule for almost 1,400 years. And so why is it only now that the Christians have been so violently persecuted and driven out? Why is it that 15 years ago, there was a Christian population of well over a million in Iraq and now they have almost all gone. And there are only a few, maybe a couple hundred thousand, if that, left in the country and more are leaving all the time. Why is this happening now? If this is all about the Quran, if this is all about Islamic ideas of being, executing the wrath of Allah against the unbelievers, then how is it that Muslims and Christians lived in relative peace and harmony in Iraq for all those centuries? Well, that has to do with once again, the Quran and other aspects of Islamic theology. The Quran in chapter 9, verse 29, it says, fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, remember that's the Jews and Christians mainly, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Jizya is a tax. And so the Christians have to be fought against until they pay a tax and are subdued, subjugated, under the rule of Islam. Once they do that, once they submit, then they're allowed essentially to live in peace. This is Islamic law. The submission, however, comes on the basis of an institutionalized discrimination, a second-class status that is very carefully detailed in Islamic law. The dhimmis, the protected people they're called, or the dhimmi, zummis, they are not allowed to hold authority over Muslims, so they only ho have the most menial jobs in society. And you can even see to this day in Pakistan, the colloquial term, the slang name for Christians in the society is street sweepers. And you, some, I sometimes come across news stories where a Muslim is saying, these sweepers, they were, they were being insolent. And they're called street sweepers because that's the kinds of jobs they can get. They can't get a job where they hold authority over a Muslim. That would be contrary to Islamic law. Uh, Christians in the, is, I, under the rule of Islamic law who have been subjugated as per that Quran verse also cannot build new churches or repair old ones. So their communities are always in a perpetual state of decline. They cannot uh, hold, they cannot Not only can they not build new churches or repair old ones, but they can, you have men can, 
I always, I, I'm sorry, I'm stopping here because I always, I always say, misstate this and I want to be careful to say it properly. Muslim women cannot marry non-Muslim men, but Muslim men can marry non-Muslim women. And you sometimes hear Islamic apologists in the West say, uh, you see, the Islam is very ecumenical and generous because Muslim men can marry non-Muslim women and they don't have to convert. Isn't that wonderful? Well, that might be wonderful, but the reality is that it's another supremacist ex a, a manifestation that Muslim men can marry non-Muslim women, but Muslim women cannot marry non-Muslim men. The idea is, of course, the woman goes into the man's household and the Muslim community is always growing, whereas the non-Muslim community is always declining. It's the same impulse as behind the law that mandates that Muslim, uh, Christians can't build new churches or repair old ones. So you have various other regulations. In some cases uh, throughout history, the uh, Christians and the Jews were forbidden to wear shoes, to ride horses. They had to, like in the old Jim Crow laws in the Old South, the non-Muslims had to step off the street and let the Muslims pass if the Muslims were coming and so on. All of this is designed to remind the Christian that they have re rebelled against the true God and that they have strayed from the right path and that they are suffering in this world as well as the next because of their rejection of Muhammad and the Quran and Islam. But once you're in those boundaries, once you have accepted the subjugated status, the second class status, and you know that your life hangs on the whim of the overlords, and you accept the denial of basic rights that the dhimma entails, then you can live. And so the Christians who lived in Mosul for centuries under the Islamic caliphates, going back to the seventh century, they lived in peace as long as they knew their place. If they got out of line, they would be killed. And there were various periods of relaxation, just as there are in any society under any legal system, times when it's enforced very rigorously and times when it's not enforced so rigorously. And so there were times when the Christians were able to even in a relative sense prosper, particularly in the decline of the last caliphate, the, uh, the, cal the caliph is the successor of Muhammad as the spiritual, military, and political leader of the Muslims. And the caliph was, the, the caliphates ruled over much of Islam, the Islamic world all the way through history up until 1924 when the last caliphate was abolished by the secular Turkish government. But the last caliphate, the Ottoman Empire, you may know if you studied history, was referred to as the sick man of Europe in the late 19th century and the early 20th century because it was in such a drastically weakened state. And in that period, the Western powers, at a time when the West was much more confident about its own principles than it is today, actually pressured the Ottomans to relax some of these restrictions on the Christians and to abolish some of these laws that had mandated their second class status. And the last of them were abolished in the year 1856. And so after 1856, in the Middle East, and particularly in Iraq, which is an Ottoman province, you had Christians living in relative peace, general peace, and general almost equality with the Muslims. It's never been legal in any Muslim country, even secular Turkey, for Christians to proselytize and try to convert Muslims. But otherwise, they really were living in a uh, state of almost equality. Now that brings us into modern times and then by the time you have Saddam Hussein there and the Iraq war that toppled him, you have various Islamic groups, both Sunni and Shiite, that wanted to restore the rule of Islamic law, wanted to restore es especially the subjugated status of the Christians, the dhimma, the second class status mandated in the Quran, remember in chapter nine, verse 29, where it says that the Christians must pay the jizya, the tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued, they wanted to restore that. When Barack Obama withdrew the last American troops from Iraq, they had an opportunity to do so. And the Islamic State formed out of various Sunni groups that were fighting against Bashar Assad in Syria and against the Shiite regime in Baghdad. And the Islamic State very quickly was able to gain control over a territory larger than the size of the United Kingdom, and it still controls that today. 
One of the first things they did when they went into Mosul was knock on the doors of the Christians' homes and demand the jizya, the Quranic tax. And they painted the nun, the Arabic letter, the Arabic letter N for Nazarene, which is the Christians, the Quran's term for Christians, on the doors of the Christians so they would know this is a house where the Christians live. We have to make sure to collect the tax from them. The Christians didn't want to pay the tax. They hadn't paid it. Remember, uh, it was abolished in 1856. So not only had they not paid it, but their parents hadn't paid it, their grandparents hadn't paid it, their great-grandparents hadn't paid it. It was out of living memory. And here come these guys demanding that it be paid because it's in the Quran. And the Christians refused. Now, that's why their lives were forfeit. Once you refuse to obey, once you refuse to submit, then there's only other one, one other choice, and that is you are killed. There's a, a tradition, a hadith, in which Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, he says, when you meet the unbelievers, invite them to convert to Islam. If they refuse that, invite them to pay the jizya, that is, to submit and accept the second-class status. If they refuse both, then fight them. If they refuse both, then fight them. The Christians in Mosul, the Christians in Iraq in general and in Syria, they refused to pay the tax, they refused to submit. And so they were killed or they were, they were able to escape from the area. And Christian communities that had been there for 1400 years are now gone. This was all based on the reassertion of Quranic principles and Islamic principles. And it all comes down to that idea that Jesus himself enunciated, that they kill you and they think they're offering service to God. Now that is just one example of the inversion, the moral inversion that this represents. Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. There is no group to which that, more, uh, that better applies than the Islamic State today. And not only do they kill and think that they're offering service to God, but they also proudly avow that they love death. And this is one more Quran passage in chapter 62, verse 6. It says, O you who are Jews, if you arrogantly claim that you are God's chosen to the exclusion of others, then long for death if you are truthful. If you claim that you're God's chosen people, the Quran says to the Jew, then long for death. Now, that's a very strange thing to say. And some people might say, well, that just has to do with a willingness to be a martyr. And that might be all there is to it, except there are under other indications that there's more than that involved. The Islamic jihadis of the Islamic State and other groups, Al-Qaeda and others like them, they have many, many times affirmed over the years, we will win because we love death more than you love life. We love death more than you love life. Jokhar Tsarnaev, the Boston Marathon bomber, when he was captured, when he was almost captured, he was in that boat. Do you remember? He fled to a pleasure boat in the suburbs and was hiding inside it. And the police were closing in. And he found a Sharpie in the boat and he started writing on the inside of the boat. And what he wrote, one of the things that he wrote was, we look into the barrels of your guns and we see paradise. Because we love death. Now, loving death is obviously the opposite of the Christian spirit and the idea of loving life, of God being the author of life, and we love life and we love creation and we love the manifestations of the human spirit that celebrate those things. Another thing that the Islamic State has done that you may have seen in the news is destroy priceless and irreplaceable Assyrian artifacts, 2,000, 3,000 years old, that they came into control of and going into the, uh, the museum in Mosul and smashing them to bits. And you may have read that this was uh, to avoid idolatry, but nobody was really worshiping old Assyrian winged horses. And that's not really what it was all about. Chapter 3, verse 137 of the Quran says, Go around the world and see what became of the civilizations before you. And that means go around the world and look at the ruins. Because the ruins are testimony to the judgment of Allah. 
that these, these civilizations were idolatrous and were unbelieving, and Allah punished them and destroyed them. And so, and who, how does Allah punish and destroy unbelievers? By the hands of the believers. So, if Allah is punishing and destroying the unbelievers by the hands of the believers and showing thereby his power, and the Quran commands you to go around the world and look at the ruins and see what became of the civilizations that rejected Allah, then there's another divine responsibility that the Muslims have to create ruins, to destroy, because that in itself shows the power of Allah. So you have a group like the Islamic State that loves death and that loves destruction and that denies the cross and denies the redemption of Christ and hates women. You have probably heard about, I won't just, I'll spare you all the revolting details, but the sexual slavery, there's a very illuminating piece in all places, the New York Times today, about the uh, Islamic State's practice of sexual slavery and how it's based on the Quran. And so much else that shows that we are facing in that a quintessential anti-life force, a quintessentially evil force, a force that is perhaps a more concentrated evil than has ever before been encountered in history. And that's not excluding the Nazis or the communists, although they certainly rival it. And so the Islamic State has very often said that it's coming down to the end. It considers that it is preparing for the twilight battle, the last struggle between good and evil, and they see themselves as the good. And the, even their magazine is called Dabik, which is a town in Syria where in Islamic tradition, that's where the Armageddon battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil will take place. They see all this in those terms, and I believe that they've got a point in that, and that we need to see this in those terms as well. Not necessarily, not to be presumptuous and say, oh yes, this is the end of the world. I think it's always good to be cautious about prophecies like that and applying them to our own age. But certainly that this is a challenge to the church and to Christians, each individual Christian, such as never been seen before, and or at least has not been seen since the very early Roman persecutions. And that we are called upon now to understand exactly what's at stake and to know that the stakes are indeed very high, that this group and groups like it are gonna keep coming no matter what. And they're gonna keep advancing because they have an imperative to rule the world in the, by their own uh, uh, statements. They're gonna keep advancing until they're stopped. And how and when they will be stopped, well, a lot of that, of course, will be a military thing, but it's also a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle requires spiritual weapons. It requires not only prayer and fasting, the two things that the Lord said about the most virulent demons, this kind can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. But not only that, but also something that I think is very much lacking in the West today and that we each have a responsibility to try to restore and that is an understanding of an appreciation for what Judeo-Christian Western civilization has brought to the world. Students in schools nowadays, in public schools all over the country, you're, I'm sure you're aware of this, are more often than not taught to be embarrassed at being an American and being embarrassed at being a Christian or coming from a Christian background. And understanding that all that means is racism and oppression. And these things coalesce very nicely with the Islamic State's agenda and with the agenda of Islamic supremacism in general. That a group that does not appreciate what it is, who they are, and what it has, and what it has done is not going to defend itself. And a group that cannot understand the value of what it has brought to the world doesn't even have any desire to defend itself. And yet, this is the civilization that has brought, we are the children and heirs of the civilization that has brought to the world concepts that we take for granted, that we think are as natural as breathing, 
to be freedom of speech is the cornerstone of a free society. The concept of the equality of dignity of all people before the law. That's a quintessentially Christian concept stemming from the idea that we are all created in God's image and endowed with his spirit. There is no other religion that teaches that. In the Quran, chapter 48, verse 29, it says, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah. Those who follow him are merciful to one another and ruthless to the unbelievers. And it says in chapter 3, verse 110, to the Muslims, you are the best of people on earth. The best of people. Whereas in chapter 98, verse 6, it says of the unbelievers, the unbelievers among the people of the book, that is the Jews and Christians who don't become Muslim, are the vilest, the most vile of created beings. Now that's not the idea of the equality of dignity of all people, the that from which comes the idea of the equality of rights of all people before the law. These things are foreign to Islamic societies, and there's a very good reason for it. They're not taught in Islam. And you add to that the institutionalized discrimination against the people of the book. And you see even more reason why these societies are so stratified and do not have concepts of universal justice. And these things are our own patrimony. And it is very, very important. It is, there is nothing else more important than that we impart them with the faith and with an understanding of history to our children, our children's children, and help them to see that there is a very big difference, contrary to the popular cliche today, in what whether you believe one thing or another. And it does matter what you believe. It does matter the content of the assumptions that you bring to the world, and that the uh, beliefs that come from the Quran are beliefs that lead to hatred and violence and oppression. Does this mean that every, every Muslim, every believer in the Quran is hateful and violent and oppressive? Of course not. If you think about the Christians that you know, you know that there are some who are very devout and very knowledgeable and some who are neither and every gradation in between. And it's the same thing with Muslims. If the Quran teaches something, it doesn't necessarily mean that any individual Muslim has any knowledge of it or any interest in it. But that doesn't mean it's not there. And that we need to understand that it is there. And that what is going on in Iraq, what's going on in Syria, what's going on in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in Egypt, and elsewhere where Christians are being persecuted today, it's not an accident, it's not a retaliation, for American foreign policy, it's not a response to depredations, uh, real or alleged, of the United States or of the State of Israel. It is something that is based very deeply, as I've tried to show briefly today, on Quranic imperative. And as such, it's not going to go away as long as there are believers in the Quran. There's not going to be any kind of dialogue or negotiation or concession that will change it. What, we can't, what can change it, of course, is the power of the truth. Insofar as we ourselves have the courage to stand upon that truth without the slightest compromise and without the slightest demur and without the slightest hesitation in the face of what are certain to be in the coming days and months and years increasingly virulent and even violent challenges. And so the good news is, is that we know how it ends up and we know that we will win. We know that life always triumphs over death. We know that life will never be entirely extinguished. And that, you know, uh, even in Soviet Union, at the times when it was most violent and oppressive, Solzhenitsyn wrote about how there were little movements here and there, what he called blades of grass through the concrete, that showed that the spirit of freedom and the spirit of life and the true spirit of service and love for God will never be extinguished from the human spirit. But getting from here to there, it's not going to be a very easy ride. And there are hard times ahead. And of course, uh, we have abundant warnings about that and abundant advice about how to deal with it in the, in, in, in the Christian scriptures. And so that ultimately is where we can find the answers to this tremendous challenge. And it is indeed a tremendous challenge. We have the best of all fighters on our side, 
in the Lord. But we have to be willing to stand for him no matter what as he stands for us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Our schedule calls for a time of Q&A uh, with uh, Robert Spencer, and uh, if you'd like to ask him uh, some questions uh, that perhaps have arisen as a result of, of what you've been hearing, please go to a microphone, and uh, we'll, we'll call on you, and we'll allow him to uh, address your questions. A comment from uh, Redeemer Lutheran in Owasso, Michigan. Uh, do Dr. Spencer, there have been persistent uh, reform movements within Christianity. Is there any such a concept, you think, uh, possible or likely within Islam? It's always possible. I'd never say it's not possible, but likely, I think not. Uh, in Islam, there is the idea that the Quran was delivered in perfect form, and there is a passage where... Allah says to Muhammad, this day I have perfected your religion for you. So if the religion is perfect, what, what needs reforming? Reformers also, in a context in which the penalty for apostasy and heresy is death, it's very hard to get a reform movement going because the reformers keep getting killed. <laughs> uh, it's, you could say, well, you know, Christianity went through times like that and it was because a kindly prince uh, gave Martin Luther shelter and so on, but there have not been any such in Islam. Uh, Mahmoud Muhammad Taha was a Sudanese reformer in 1985, and he taught that the peaceful passages of the Quran should supersede the violent ones, and he was executed for, for heresy by the Sudanese government in 1985. Ahmed Asid is a, uh, a lay spokesman in Morocco nowadays, and he taught the same thing just recently, uh, earning him a uh, death fatwa from the Moroccan clerics, and he's now living in hiding. So it's very difficult to reform given those circumstances. A anything is possible, but it's, it's very unlikely, and it's very foolish of the Western governments to be putting their hope in that reform, which they're doing now. Yes, sir. I can hear you. This, I'll repeat the question. Has what? Has what led to it? Oh, yes. Okay. <coughs> sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take the second question first. In case you didn't hear it, it was about uh, the war in Iraq and did I believe that the war in Iraq and the toppling of Saddam Hussein has contributed to the current chaos. 
And there's no doubt about it, yes, certainly. And this is obviously not the intention of uh, the United States uh, in toppling Saddam Hussein, but it uh, was, I believe, ill-considered. And the problem is, is that there are no good guys in that battle. Saddam Hussein was a vicious and brutal dictator. But without a vicious and brutal dictator, what you have in Iraq are three former Ottoman provinces that all hate each other. The Kurds, Sunni Kurds, Sunni Arabs, and Shiite Arabs. And there's no Iraqi nationality. It's a, it's a fictional country like Yugoslavia or Belgium that has no uh, cohesion, no, no natural cohesion, uh, either ethnically or politically or religiously. And so uh, without a strong man, it's going to fly apart. And given the context, you're going to have Sunni Shiite strife and attempts to impose Islamic law on the Christians, and that's exactly what we got. Uh, I think the Bush administration and the Obama administration, because they both have subscribed to these politically correct fantasies about Islam being a religion of peace, they did not have any idea that any of this was going to happen. Uh, but they should have. Uh, the first question, Reza Aslan is a very popular uh, Muslim writer and uh, apologist who makes part of his uh, makes it part of his business to assure non-Muslims that Islam doesn't really teach warfare or hatred or uh, any of these things that we see committed in its name all the time, which only begs the question of why is it that so many Muslims are misunderstanding Islam in such a severe manner and all in the same way. Uh, but in any case, I find the question very strange because the gentleman asked, it said that in his book, No God But God, which I admit I have not read, uh, he says that the Byzantine Christians were not even considered people of the book. Does that mean they were considered worse? Yes. Uh, I don't think that that's historically accurate. Um, the, as a matter of fact, if you read, going back to Sophronius of Jerusalem, who was, of course, a Byzantine Christian in the seventh century, who, according to legend, turned over the keys of Jerusalem to the Caliph Umar, Umar lays out precisely the regulations that the people of the book have to follow mm -hmm. for living under the Islamic society. And they are a constant of Byzantine history after that point. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, uh, if that's indeed what Reza Aslan says, it's a strange thing for him to say since he's usually saying everything is rosy. Right. But it, it's, it's, it's not inconsistent with his record to be inaccurate. Um, if you actually, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you look at uh, my website, Jihad Watch, I have just a few days ago a whole long catalog of his egregiously false statements that he makes, but he has the right opinions, and so he keeps yeah, making more. He gets Christianity wrong too. But thank yes. you very much, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jason Graham from Prescott, Arizona. Uh, in light of this <coughs> talk about the religion of peace, would you say something about the doctrine of abrogation between the Mecca and the Medinan text? Sure. Uh, chapter 2, verse 106 of the Quran says, when we abrogate or cause to be forgotten a verse, then we will give you one that is good or better. We being God. So he's saying, if we cancel out a part of the scripture, we'll give you something just as good, so don't worry about it. Now that obviously is a passage that was invented by somebody who's making it up as he goes along. And he's contradicting himself, and then he has to explain the how, is this, how it is that the immortal God is contradicting himself. And so he's canceling stuff out. It doesn't uh, apply. The uh, Islamic theology generally understands this to mean that chronologically later passages that were considered to have been revealed later in Muhammad's career cancel out ones that are earlier if there's any contradiction. The most uh, frequently cited example of this is alcohol. There's a passage in the Quran that says, don't come to prayers drunk. That's all. Don't come to prayers drunk, which implies that you can be drinking. Just don't come to prayers after you've been imbibing, over imbibing. Then there's a passage that says, there is some good in alcohol, but the bad outweighs the good. And so it's getting worse. And then there's a passage that says alcohol is from Satan. So don't drink it. So this is considered to be a progression, easing the Muslims into the idea of the prohibition, the total prohibition of alcohol. Okay, that's fine. It's a little bit odd that it would say that there's some good in it and then that it's from Satan, but we can leave that aside. Later on, you have the problem of the violent passages and the peaceful ones. 
In the beginning of Muhammad's career, according to Islamic tradition, he was a preacher of various religious ideas. He did not have any political or military power, and he taught tolerance. It was actually tolerance of himself. He wanted the pagan Arab establishment of Mecca to tolerate his group. When he moved to Medina later in his career and became for the first time a political and military leader, then he began to teach warfare, first defensive warfare and then offensive warfare. And there are various passages regarding all three in the Quran, and the general idea is the same, that because the passages enjoining warfare come later than the passages enjoining tolerance, the warfare is valid for all time and applies for all time. Nowadays, though, you hear people, you hear Islamic spokesmen like Reza Aslan and others say that Islam is a religion of peace, and they quote all these peaceful passages from the Quran. What they don't tell you is, is that those very passages are considered to have been abrogated in Islamic theology by more violent passages. And they only apply when Muslims are in a situation comparable to the situation of the Muslims in Mecca. So when the Muslims are a small group that is weak and has no political or military power, then they preach tolerance. That's the situation in the United States today. But as they grow, they become more aggressive and start preaching warfare. That's what we're seeing in Europe now. And it'll come here again soon. It'll come here as well soon. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Nicholas, thank you for that. Uh, I'm a little ticked off because that wasn't my question. Um, <laughs> But I'm glad that you went on that, that line of answering because now, uh, given the you know, explanation you've given concerning alcohol, I'm, I'm so glad I'm not a Muslim and a Lutheran Canadian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to have to think of another question. I, have, I actually had two, so I'm going to ask you the more simple one first. In, in Nazi Germany, there, there was a symbol that was used for those who were, who were Jews. And that actually did not come from Nazi Germany, did it? It came from African Islam, is that not correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. It came from the Caliph Mutawakil in the ninth century, who uh, made the Jews and Christians put symbols of devils over the doors of their houses and uh, made them wear special clothing. And the Jews' clothing was yellow and the Christians was blue. And this was to mark them so that a Muslim coming down the street would not say, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, to a non-Muslim, because that's forbidden in Islamic law. In Islamic law, you say, you, you say, if I see you, if we're both Muslims and I see you, I say, assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. And you say, wa alaikum, or, and also upon you, not with you, upon you. But if you see a non-Muslim coming, you say, peace be upon those who are rightly guided. That is, peace be upon the Muslims, not on you. And so the Caliph Mutawakil made the Christians and Jews wear distinctive dress so that they would not get the Islamic greeting by mistake and so that they could be marked very easily for the payment of this tax and so on. So if I can ask one quick question, in place of the other one that he stole from me, um, <laughs> is could you explain if, uh, your understanding at all about the discovery of the first uh, um, uh, Quran in, in Yemen and the implications it has for, uh, for the Quran? Yeah, you know, I guess you've heard Thank about you. the, uh, the, the original Quran, or the, the very early copy of the Quran that was recently discovered uh, in Birmingham, England, actually. And it was uh, da carbon dated, a couple of pages of chapters 18 through 20 of the Quran, and found to be dated between uh, 540, I think, uh, five, 550 to 575 to 650. And so everybody was amazed because this would obviously make it the one of the earliest Qurans and people were going on in the BBC about how the person who wrote this might have been taking dictation from Muhammad himself and so on. Muhammad uh, is supposed to have died in 632 and the Quran collected in 653. So if this is dated from 570 to 650, it's, it's very early. But one thing that the people who made a big deal about this didn't notice or didn't pay any attention to was that 570 date. Muhammad is supposed to have become a prophet in the year 610 and died in the year 632. So if this document could have come from between 570 and 610, it might not be the Quran at all. It might be some of the bits that were taken to make up the Quran. Yeah. Because the Quran itself bears very many signs. I wrote a book about this a few years ago. Did Muhammad exist? Available at any self-respecting bookstore. And <laughs> in it, <coughs> in it, 
the Quran, th there are very, very many strange things about the Quran, but in it, it shows very many signs of heavy editing. And as a matter of fact, there was a rec another recent manuscript discovery in Tübingen in Germany that uh, was dated from in, in the 670s, and they published page after page of it online, and I was just amazed looking at it because you see all these places where stuff is erased and other things written over it. And I thought this exactly confirms what we, uh, I and some others have been contending, that the Quran is a, a, a composite book made up of other older material that was cobbled together to, g to create the holy book of this new religion. See, uh, if you look historically, there, Muhammad is supposed to have died in 632, and by the 690s, the Muslims rule from, from Spain to India. And yet, if you look in the contemporary records of that period, there is nary a mention. All the while the Arabs are conquering everywhere, nobody mentions these people came in with a new prophet and a new holy book and a new religion. Nobody mentions that. Can you imagine? These conquests were supposed to be energized, were supposed to be inspired by Muhammad in the Quran, and in 60 years of those conquests, nobody mentions Muhammad or the Quran or Islam. And the people who are conquering aren't even called Muslims by the people who, who they conquer and who leave records as to what happened. Sophronius of Jerusalem, who I mentioned before, being one of them. He's supposed to have taken Umar around the city and so on, but in his own writings, he never mentions Muslims, he never mentions Umar, he never mentions that they came and said, we have a holy book, we have a new prophet, N none of that. He shows no sign that they are anything like that. And it, what it seems, if you look historically, is that Muhammad is an invention, like Robin Hood, maybe a, a historical figure, but one on whom a great deal of legend has been overlaid. And the Quran is a, is, a, is a creation by committee to create a religion. And why is this religion created? Because the Arabs conquered all this, all this land. In those days, you didn't have constitutions, you didn't have parliaments, you had a single unifying religion. The Byzantine Empire was Christian, the Persian Empire was Zoroastrian. The religion unified the empire. The Arabs amassed this huge empire. They needed a religion to hold it together. And they made that religion martial and expansionist, imperialist and belligerent to make sure that those virtues, so to speak, would be inculcated into, those, into their people so as to make sure the empire would be continue to be strong and expand. And so anyway, this discovery of this supposed ancient Quran actually only undermines even further the standard Islamic story of the origins of Islam. Yes, sir. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, yes. Um, Doug Gilner, Annapolis area Lutheran Church in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, first of all, I, I agree with people who speak of chiefs like yourself have to have such heavy guards surrounding them all the time. It's sad. Anyway, uh, my question is uh, a point of clarification. You were talking about the Christians of Mosul living for 1,400 years in relative peace and then that changed. Was that because simply they were not required to, play, uh, to pay the jizya? jizya the, wh wh what I meant was this. When they lived under the caliphates, the Umayyad, the Abbasid, and the Ottoman caliphates, they did pay the jizya. And they were sub subdued. They did submit to Islamic rule. That's when they lived in relative peace. Now, it was always a very, very tenuous peace, and their lives could be forfeit at any moment for a perceived infraction but it wasn't the wholesale destruction that you see today. What happened is then the abolition of the jizya, the abolition of the dhimma in, in, in 1856 is followed by a period in which the Christians live almost as equals with the Muslims in that area. But when the Islamic State comes in and wants to reassert Islamic law, they demand the jizya from the Christians. The Christians don't want to pay, and so then they're considered kufar harbi, infidels at war with Islam and thus they have to be killed. And that's what's happening now. That's why these ancient communities are being destroyed now. I'm sorry about those who, uh, I apologize. I shouldn't have been so long-winded. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. This is the only way the truth gets out. You have people who know, who are willing to share. Really, much appreciate you inviting me. And especially, I want to say, as a Catholic, that I am very grateful that you didn't, that you didn't come for me and have the U.S. Catholic Bishop represent you. Right here. This is more important. Yeah. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you.
We've come to a time of a break, but I'm going to give you a choice. If you'd like to hear the report of the ballot first and the election, uh, very good. Then we'll uh, proceed as you have decided. Uh, Pastor Carl Johnson of our Elections uh, Committee, could you bless us with your presence? Um, your humor is optional, uh, but, <laughs> but the ballot report is necessary. <laughs> the office of the bishop for a four-year term, number to be elected one, number of valid ballots 386, number necessary to elect. We have some TSA approved white smoke. <laughs> Baby powder's the best I could do. <laughs> uh, Bishop John Brodowski, 321 votes. Pastor James Lehman, uh, 65 votes. I declare Bishop John Brodowski elected to the office, office of Bishop of the North American Lutheran Church for a four-year term. so grateful for the honor that you've bestowed on me in the past and that I get the chance to continue to nurture and develop these relationships for the next four years also serving as your bishop. It is my privilege uh, and my hope that I can also be a blessing to you and your congregation as we continue to serve Christ together and to lift up his name to give expression to the truth and wonder of his word. Thank you so much for this opportunity. God bless you. Executive Council clergy, four-year term, number to be elected one, number of total ballots 383, number of invalid ballots 11, number of valid ballots 372, number necessary to elect 187, votes received, uh, Pastor Carl Rasmussen, uh, 131, Pastor Eric Waters, 129, Pastor Paul Rice, 68, Pastor Tom Huck, 44. Those pastors then that will appear on the next ballot include Pastor Carl Rasmussen, Pastor Eric Waters, and Pastor Paul Rice. Executive Council lay four-year term number to be elected one, number of valid ballots 371, number necessary to elect 186, votes received, Rosemary Johnson 212, Stephen Lord, 159, there is an election. I declare that Rosemary Johnson is elected to the Executive Council for a four-year term. <laughs> Executive Council lay two-year term, number to be elected one, number of valid ballots, 369, Number necessary to elect, 185. Votes received, Brian Sutton, 224. John Elling, 145. 
there is an election. I declare Brian Sutton elected to the Executive Council for a two-year term. At this time, we, we continue with the second ballot. If the tellers would come forward. And chaplain. Before we cast our next ballot, I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 7. Our Lord Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Let's join in a word of prayer. Almighty and most gracious God, we thank you for these disciples of Jesus, children of yours, willing to serve in leadership. We thank you for the elections that have taken place thus far and for the, those still on the ballot before us. We ask for your spirit. We seek to know your will. We knock, knowing that you open doors. So guide us as we cast our votes that our decisions would be consistent with your will. In Jesus' name, amen. There is um, one ballot, and because there's one ballot, remember, please mark one name and one name only. That's uh, a very important. We had to throw away 11 ballots that where, where people marked or voted for uh, two people. As we are voting, um, it's my duty to report to you that in the interest of full disclosure, I have not been bribed. <laughs> However, the offer is still open. It, it's only a $10 million cashier's check payable to the North American Lutheran Seminary Endowment Fund. <laughs> and if you'd all like to take up a collection, that would work too. In the interest of time, uh, we are going to ask uh, for our general secretary to bring us the report from reference and counsel and make two announcements while you're filling out your ballot. The Committee on Reference and Counsel received two resolutions uh, by the 1 p.m. deadline, uh, one having to do uh, with the uh, election process for the um, Bishop of the North American Lutheran Church, and another one having to do with 
Planned Parenthood. The recommendation of the Committee on uh, Referencing Council is that uh, time permitting, uh, we try to address both resolutions uh, later on this afternoon before dinner. Um, of course, there may not be enough time, but if, if at all possible, we would like to uh, begin with uh, the resolution on the election procedure uh, for the Office of Bishop. And then the two announcements. Um, if you're interested uh, in uh, joining in a week of confirmation camp uh, in June of 2016, You'll bring your confirmation students to join with other NALC pastors and students in the beautiful North Carolina mountains. <laughs> so, um, and I highly recommend that. Our congregation is a part of a confirmation camp that was just completed and uh, Pastor Luke uh, said it was just fabulous and Paula Murray also. So uh, anyway, would pastors Justin Kohlmeyer and Bill White please stand. So here's Justin. And where's, oh, they're right next to each other. Ah. So see them uh, if you're interested in joining together for a confirmation camp in June of 2016. Tonight, um, after uh, dinner, uh, you'll see that there's uh, a, a what looks like a long list of recognition of anniversaries, but that is not going to take a whole lot of time. Uh, Steve Bell is going to uh, do um, what he does so well, not only sing his music, but uh, really um, uh, preach the gospel to us and inspire us. And uh, there's plenty of time set aside for that. So if you were thinking of, of oh no, I'm gonna stay away from this, it's gonna be a long, <laughs> boring night, uh, we strongly encourage you to stay for dinner and stay for the full uh, agenda of events outlined after that. Thank you. Last call for ballots. Are all ballots collected? I now declare this ballot closed, and we are in recess for 15.